wide range of subjects and scintillating stars pr presenting these talks. So without further ado, we'll start with the first talk, uh, Interpreting Abnormal ERGs by Dr. Vasumati. Dr. Vasumati, may we have you on the podium, please? This one. Can I start? Not come there. Slides, please. The timer has already started and it's seven minutes now. <laughs> Can you readjust the, the timer? timer? <laughs> timer ko reset kar di. Timer ko reset karna, please. Kar di, Okay, I thought it was for 10 minutes. Uh, good afternoon, friends, and uh, thank you, VRSI, for this opportunity. So my talk is on interpreting abnormal ERG. So let me first start with full field ERG. As you're aware, the ISF protocol talks about five basic responses. The scotopic ERG, which is a purely dark adapted response in which you have isolated rod response, maximal combined response, and oscillatory potentials, and the photopic ERG, which is photopic single flash and 30 hertz flicker response. So this is how a scotopic 24 decibel ER, normal ERG looks like. And this is the peak a B wave, and this is the A wave. And this is the scotopic zero decibel single flash, or the maximal combined response. And this is the a wave, and the amplitude of the A wave is from the trough, from the baseline to the trough of the A wave. And this positive peak is the B wave, and the amplitude of the B wave is from the trough of the A wave to the peak of the B wave. And the implicit time, it's a very important parameter, both the amplitude of the B wave and the implicit time are important parameters in scotopic zero decibel, or the maximal combined response ERG. So that's from the start of the stimulus to the peak of the B wave, that is the implicit time. So abnormalities in the amplitude and the implicit time of the B wave are important because the B wave basically arises primarily due to contribution from the on bipolar cells. So any defect in the inner retina and any defect which is post phototransduction or post photoreceptor will result in a decrease in the amplitude of B wave which sometimes may reduce even below that of the A wave, in which case that's called an electronegative ERG. And uh, the A wave is predominantly from the, is due to photoreceptor hyperpolarization. So in case you want to find out whether the photoreceptors are involved, you look closely at the scotopic, uh, at the scotopic zero decibel A wave amplitude. And oscillatory potentials are a series of small wavelets on the ascending limb of the B wave in the scotopic zero decibel of the maximal combined response. And abnormalities and oscillatory potentials are being studied in diabetic retinopathy. And these are the cone responses, the photopic zero decibel, which has got the A and the B wave, as well as the 30 hertz flicker. The photopic zero decibel and the 30 hertz flicker are predominantly affected in cone dysfunction. So the full field ERG is unique and important in that you are able to analyze and separate and find out which exactly is the site of the pathology by studying the abnormalities. So the rod specific scotopic 24 decibel will talk about rod problems. The scotopic uh, zero decibel or the maximal combined response will talk both about photoreceptor problems as well as post phototransduction, while the photopic ERG will talk about the cone dysfunction. So without much ado, so we will go on to the abnormal ERG. It is important that you understand the principles, that why, that's why I had talked about that. And in retinitis pigmentosa, ERG is employed the maximum in retinitis pigmentosa. Generally, all the waves are reduced because retinitis pigmentosa is a rod cone dystrophy. And this is a normal scotopic 24 decibel and in RP it is flat. And the scotopic zero decibel is flat as well. And the photopic uh, responses are flat as well. So it's a complete rod cone dystrophy. 
And actually, depending on the ERG also, you can get an idea about the inheritance pattern in retinitis pigmentosa because if it's X-linked, at a very early age, the ERG may be severely reduced. Whereas if it is autosomal dominant retinitis pigmentosa, it's a later onset and a slower progression. And you have amplitude reduction alone without implicit time change in restricted disease. And uh, this is again rod cone dystrophy. This is pattern ERG actually. And the P50 component of a pattern ERG actually talks about the macular function and there's an N95 which talks about the optic nerve dysfunction. You see that as the visual acuity is reduced in RP, the pattern ERG becomes flat as well. And in Refsum's disease, serial ERGs can demonstrate an arrest and decline by low phytanic acid diets. And we have enhanced S-cone syndrome in which there is a very less number of rods and more of S-cones. So you have photopization of the ERG in which these cotopic uh, zero decibel as well as the photopic zero decibel look almost similar. This is a normal ERG down for comparison. And the flicker ERG is also very much reduced. And phenotypically, they may actually look very normal. Coming to cone and cone rod dystrophy, as I already told, cone and cone rod dystrophy, generally the scotopic 24 decibel and the 20 and the zero decibel, the maximal combined responses are normal. And whereas 30 hertz flicker are normal, uh, subnormal, the amplitude is subnormal and the implicit time delayed. In all my uh, figures, the down portion is the normal ERG for comparison. And you can have, de depending on the uh, presentation of the ERG, you can guess whether it's an autosomal dominant cone dystrophy or autosomal dominant cone rod dystrophy, which has both a flicker delay as well as an amplitude reduction. And we have rod and S-cone monochromatism, which present from birth. In both, actually, the 30 hertz flicker and the photopic ERG are extinguished, whereas the scotopic responses are normal. And CSNB, congenital stationary night blindness, we have the X-linked variety, which has got both the complete and the incomplete type of congenital stationary night blindness. And this congenital, complete type of congenital stationary night blindness is due to uh, the nictilopen, absence of nictilopen, which predominantly affects the on bipolar cells. So that's why this is the on-off ERG. You see that the on uh, portion alone is reduced, whereas the off is okay. And pattern ERG is definitely abnormal. And you have an electronegative ERG in all types of complete CSNB, incomplete CSNB, as well as in JXLR, juvenile X-linked retinoschisis. And in the photopic, you can distinguish based on the ERG, you can distinguish whether it's a complete or an incomplete type of CSNB because they have different prognostic implications. And in the complete CSNB, the photopic ERG A wave is broad and the B wave is sharpened. And in the incomplete CSNB, the 30 hertz flicker is notched and you have an electronegative photopic zero decibel. In fact, incomplete CSNB is the only type which has an electronegative photopic zero decibel. And complete CSNB is actually electrophysiologically indistinguishable from melanoma-associated retinopathy. And this is JXLR in which the scotopic responses are reduced, again, are absent, again, electronegative ERG, and the 30 hertz flickers are subnormal and the implicit time delayed. So why do we have ERG? You can not fulfill ERG, is helpful even in macular dystrophies. For example, in Stargardt's fundus flavi maculatus, we have three groups based on the ERG. And uh, the subgroups can be classified because again, they have prognostic implications. And this is group one in which the ERG is absolutely normal. And uh, the group two and three have cone as well as cone rod involvement as, I, as was already shown in the slides. And bullseye maculopathy, again, you have four types and uh, uh, like macular dystrophy, which is a commonest, and the other types as well. And best vitelliform dystrophy, usually you have a normal full field ERG, whereas the EOG alone is absent. Um, subnormal rise. So again, ERG can also help us to talk about the diseases of the inner retina in acquired retinopathies like central retinal vein occlusion, for example. The 30 hertz flicker time is said to be the most predictive ERG parameter for NVI with a cutoff value of 40 milliseconds. As in this, this, is, this actually looks like ischemic CRVO, but based on ERG, we can tell that it's actually non-ischemic CRVO. This is a normal ERG for comparison. And autoimmune retinopathies, carcinoma-associated retinopathy, ERG is flat. Melanoma-associated retinopathy, you have an electronegative ERG. This is a series of cases at Moofield's Eye Hospital. I had the opportunity to work on that. Uh, a series of cases of Azure in which you have a delayed, um, can I just continue for 30 seconds? And uh, you have a delay, this is a left eye Azure patient, and you can see that the left eye, the EOG light rise is very much reduced, and the 30 hertz flicker is also delayed. 
And siderosis bulbi, again, you have electronegative ERG and a flat ERG. And quickly about multifocal ERG, Stargardt's dystrophy, you can see that the central multifocal responses alone are reduced. Even in type 1 Stargardt's, you can pick up by multifocal ERG. And hydroxychloroquine retinopathy, this is another talk on that. Multifocal ERG gives very good information regarding that. And the Azure cases, I will just skip again. And in Azure, actually, multifocal ERG corresponds to the uh, field abnormalities as well, as you can see in this case. This case at Azure, and you can see that corresponding to the field abnormalities, the multifocal ERG also is very much reduced. So we have several applications of uh, ERG, and it's really been a game changer in the way we manage uh, retinal disorders. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Vasumati, for Thanks. briefly presenting a vast topic. <clears throat> now, none of the presenters needs any kind of introduction at all, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Cooperman to talk to us about role of neuroprotection in treatment of retinal diseases. Thank you, and neuroprotection, an important uh, field uh, that we're struggling with. Uh, I think we think it's the best way to approach atrophic age-related macular degeneration. The slides are not, a, there we go, and by way of financial disclosure. So again, what we want to do in this is to stop retinal neuronal cell death. And this is a balancing act, balancing out the pro-death signals and the pro-survival signals. And the challenge is how to do this. Apoptosis is a critical part of this process, program cell death. It's useful in some situations, not as useful in other situations. And again, uh, this is the challenge that we're facing. It's a large unmet need right now. We have uh, for not only for uh, atrophy, geographic atrophy, but in many posterior segment diseases, such as diabetic macular ischemia, chronic macular edema, retinal detachment, and as I mentioned, geographic atrophy and retinitis pigmentosa. We have multiple pathways that we're exploring. Uh, bromonidine, which is a selective alpha-2 receptor agonist, as you know, ciliary neurotrophic factor, memantine, corticosteroids, and complement inhibition, and I'll focus on bromonidine and complement inhibition for the purposes of this brief talk. So the goal of cytoneuroprotection, we're not really trying to reverse the process. We're trying to slow the process down. And we call it cytoprotection as well because we're trying to protect the RPE cells, which are not neurological cells, as well as the Mueller cells and some of the other cells. So again, it's cytoneuroprotection, the goal being to slow down this process uh, to make RPE and photoreceptors more resistant to injury. Bromonidine has been uh, implied in a broad, for uh, many years. Our own lab has shown it uh, has some benefits in human retinal, in RP19 cell line as well as the Mueller cell line. And more importantly, there's been uh, blue light phototoxicity model and the low pressure glaucoma treatment study, where in that study, for the similar lowering of intraocular pressure compared to other agents, there was a greater preservation of visual field, hence that was implied that there was some neuroprotection from bromonidine. So this is a drug delivery system very analogous to uh, the Osrodex system in that it has the same polylactic glycolic acid polymer there and now infused with bromonidine. And there's been a phase 2A and a phase 2B study. I was more involved in the phase 2A study and have that data here. It was a 12-month study. Um, and what it showed was there was a 27% reduction in growth rate of the geographic area of geographic atrophy at 12 months. Now that was not clinically uh, that was not statistically significant, I should say. It was at three months, but the drug delivery system at that point felt to be eluding the drug too rapidly, and there was not much left at 12 months. But in fact, what happened when there's a subset analysis or a better analysis of this, and you can see that this, uh, by comparison to the lesion size, the lesions that were greater in size, that is nine millimeters squared or greater, seemed to have the largest effect. And when that subset analysis was done, this was found to be statistically significant with a 37% growth rate reduction over the course of 12 months for the larger lesion sizes, which will be the focus of the phase three trial that's being planned. What's nice about this is that there seems to be no safety issues whatsoever. Again, this is a drug we're all used to. The polymer is also uh, something we're used to, so this is likely to be a very safe combination with no known uh, side effects to date that have been observed, either in the phase 2A or the phase 2B studies, and a phase 3 study has been designed and should be underway uh, over the course of the next year. Now let's look at complement inhibition. Uh, there's been a variety of agents that have been looked at, most with no success, as we unfortunately know. I'll discuss the Apelis uh, Philly trial, the C3 inhibition, as well as the failed uh, complement factor D inhibition study by Genentech, the Chroma and Spectri, tr Spectri trials. Now, without going into too much detail about complement inhibition, uh, we know that there's uh, a variety of the, that's been implied 
There's presence of complement in Drusen, but it's not clear that it's still present in geographic atrophy. However, there's still great interest in exploring complement inhibition of the complement pathway as a mechanism of treating uh, ge geographic atrophy. One of the concerns about this whole approach is that complement is there to protect us from infection. So is there going to be an increased risk of infection or other side effects from an effective complement inhibitor? Well, this is Apelis uh, APL2. It's a C3 inhibitor. And you can see on this cascade, it inhibits inflammation um, and ultimately a C5 formation in the MAC complex, which leads to cell death. So the whole goal is to inhibit that whole cascade of events. What was done in the Philly trial, the phase two trial that we're all aware of, there was a 2 2 one, one randomization. The doses were all the same. It was the frequency of administration. So there was either monthly injection, every other month injection, and the two appropriate control groups. Uh, injections were given for 12 months, and patients were followed for additional six months after that for a total 18-month study. One of the sources of concern from that study was that there is a, a history of cordial neovascularization, the fellow eye, that was allowed in the study, and that ended up being a, a significant subset of the patients and maybe a risk factor for what happened subsequently. What we can see the nice effect was that there was a reduction in growth by about 29 percent, and that was statistically significant at 12 months. Uh, you can see that from the growth rate inhibition that it was not much visible in the first six months. Where it was visible was in the second six months. You can see a dramatic reduction in the growth rates then. So again, it's a delayed effect that we see after the drug has been treated for some time. I see here that, uh, so here we see the vision was not impacted. So unfortunately, these are studies that are showing slowdown of the growth rate of the lesion size, but not yet any benefit vision-wise. I realize I left that slide out of the bromonidine study. Also in the bromonidine study, there's no benefit in vision, just the slowdown of the uh, lesion size. Now, the concern about this one is the adverse event profile. There is new onset exudation that seemed to be correlated to the dose, that is the frequency of the administration. 20% in the monthly injection, 21% actually, 9% in the every other month, and in the sham control group, a very low population of uh, new onset uh, CNV in the treated eyes of only of the sham eyes of 1%. So again, this is something that will need to be explored more, explored more carefully in the phase three trial. They've decided in the phase three trial, which is on hold because of manufacturing issues and other related issues, but they decided to still allow fellow, fellow eye coronal neovascularization. The reason was in these patients that develop coronal neovascularization, the exudation tended to be quite mild. It was picked up quite rapidly because the patients are followed on a monthly basis and they were treated successfully, but it still is a long-term source of concern. The other source of concern is the rate of endophthalmitis. It was not statistically significant. It's very small sample size, two in the monthly group, one in the every other month group, and uh, zero in the sham pooled group. But one question that is arisen from this, is this a consequence of complement inhibition? If complement is there to help us protect us from infection, does this going, are we going to have an increased risk of infection in eyes with successful complement inhibition? We don't know the answer to that. It's premature to speculate on it. I mean, it's premature to make any strong convention. We can only speculate on it at the current time. We'll see what happens in the phase three trial, whether there's still an increased risk of endophthalmitis. So again, it was an effective therapy, 28% reduction in growth of the lesion size over the course of uh, 12 months. That impact seemed to be greater between 6 and 12 months, but we are concerned about some of the side effect profile that is, is there an increased risk of infection, early to say, and there certainly is an increased risk of, of uh, choroidal neovascularization and eyes treated with this that we need to pay attention going forward. I'll close with a few slides on the failed um, chroma and spectry trial. Again, this was the complement factor D inhibition from lampalizumab that had a mildly successful large phase two trial from Mahalo, borderline effect where we saw something like a 20% reduction at 18 months. There's some concerns about that data. But again, complement factor T is the rate limiting and enzyme of the alternate complement pathway. And what was looked at was a huge effort. They've almost 2,000 patients, 975 in spectry, 906 patients in chroma, so a huge effort. There was also a focus, a subset of complement factor I, which I'll discuss in a moment, uh, that may have been a, uh, uh, something they were looking at as well, but we'll get to that in a moment. What was seen, unfortunately, no benefit whatsoever. You can see in this full sample size, the pooled sample size, no benefit in the individual trials as well. No slowdown in the rate of, uh, of growth of the lesion size. In the complement factor I a subset analysis, there have been an al uh, some hope uh, that, in the that uh, complement factor I is a negative regulator of the alternate complement pathway, and uh, they thought that might be linked to the risk of advanced macular degeneration. In the phase two Mahalo trial, there was some evidence that that uh, in an exploratory subgroup that there was a differential response, so that was looked at here as well, and unfortunately you can see in the complement factor I positive, 
uh, compared to complement factor I negative, there was no significant di uh, difference, even though this was uh, several hundred patients involved. So that was also a failed event. They looked everywhere. They were, as uh, many people have said, uh, Rick Ferris's owners, they tortured the data, but it did not confess. No matter what they tried, no matter how many times they turned this data upside down, they found no subgroup that had any benefit whatsoever. It was, uh, there was also no benefit in vision, as has been seen in the other trials. There was no safety issues. There was no endophthalmitis. There was no development of fellow eye neovascularization. Maybe this is a factor of a lack of complement inhibition in this, in this subset of patients. So in conclusion, neuroprotection for retinal diseases are uh, still continue to be a significant unmet need in a variety of things that's really being focused on more in geographic atrophy and retinitis pigmentosa. I haven't discussed our efforts in retinitis pigmentosa. We have some stem cells, which are neurotrophic factors, uh, 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 factories, and so that's some data that I'll present at another time where there may be some benefit for retinitis pigmentosa as well. We've looked at a variety of things, uh, potential pathways, but right now the ones that are most advanced uh, the Brabant work on bromonidine and complement inhibition, but these studies continue to be underway. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Now I invite Dr. Adrian Koh for his talk on autoimmune retinopathy. Thank you very much, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak on autoimmune retinopathy associated with retinal dystrophies. There are no uh, uh, important financial disclosures related to this talk. Autoimmune retinopathy is defined as an immunologic process whereby antibodies are produced against retinal antigens, which are normal, uh, but they are thought to be an autoimmune process because it leads to progressive retinal degeneration. I think that is probably the most important aspect of autoimmune retinopathy. And usually these patients would have very rapid, acute or subacute progressive visual loss. There may be typical progressive changes on the full field ERG. I'm glad that that was uh, very thoroughly covered in the first talk. And of course, circulating antibodies must be identified against relevant uh, retinal antigens. The classification of uh, autoimmune retinopathy is controversial, but this is the one that I use most often. On the one hand, paraneoplastic anti, uh, autoimmune retinopathy is the most important. You've got carcinoma-associated retinopathy, melanoma-associated retinopathy, and B-dump, bilateral diffuse uveal melanocytic proliferation. I will not be covering paraneoplastic autoimmune retinopathy today. My main focus will be on non-paraneoplastic, which can be further subdivided into primary and secondary causes. Under the secondary causes, you see a whole long list of which retinal dystrophies is probably the most common, but you'll see others like uveitis, uh, azor, white dot syndromes, and so on. We confirmed the diagnosis using a Western immunoblot, looking for antibodies against uh, uh, retinal antigens. The typical proteins will be recovering, which is 23 KDA, uh, enolase 46, and the rest uh, are as listed, carbonic anhydrase, and so on. But what's important is if you see a 23 anti-recovering antibody, think very hard about underlying malignancy. That is because perineoplastic uh, autoimmune retinopathy is commonly associated with either 23 or 46 KDA-positive antibodies. This is just a, an important reminder not to miss underlying malignancy. Whereas for non perineoplastic uh, you see a spread of the various uh, autoantibodies. Now let's talk about non perineoplastic primary uh, autoimmune retinopathy. First, there must be no evidence of systemic malignancy, no evidence of an underlying retinal disorder, such as a dystrophy. Usually the ERG, in the maximal ERG, will show an electronegative waveform, that is the B wave is less than the A wave. There is often a strong personal and family history of autoimmune disease, making them predisposed, perhaps, to autoimmune retinopathy, and of course, the presence of antibodies. This is an illustration of what an electronegative waveform looks like. You can see a normal A wave in case four and case seven. These are two of uh, my cases, uh, and a significant reduction in the B wave compared to the normal. So features suggestive of secondary non-perineoplastic uh, non 
uh, autoimmune retinopathy, are patients who have already a retinal dystrophy, so they are known cases to us. They have or report rapid progression of disease, very often associated with rapid field loss. Very importantly, the symptom of smokiness of vision is quite distinctive. Patients do not just complain of blurred vision. They will, they will tell you that they are almost walking into a smoke-filled room. Increased photopsias is also prominent, hypersensitivity to light, often with cystoid macular edema, deep vitreous cells if you look hard enough, and uh, interestingly, we found also a thickened choroid compared to the fellow eye and to non-autoimmune uh, retinopathy-related uh, retinal dystrophy. So to describe this uh, phenomenon, uh, we looked at uh, 47 patients in my center with non-paraneoplastic autoimmune retinopathy. We performed blood tests, uh, Western blood test at the Ocular Immunology Lab in Casey. Uh, this is the only CLIA uh, accredited um, test, uh, uh, blood uh, laboratory uh, for serum antibodies. We had 47 patients in all. You can see the uh, spread, uh, mainly Chinese, a mean age of 49 years, and 64% with a history of autoimmune disease. So this is quite consistent uh, with previous observations. Among the underlying causes, you see 39 patients had an inherited retinal disease, most commonly in retinitis pigmentosa and cone rod dystrophy. But we also had a few cases uh, consisting of Bietes and X-linked retinal schisis. Interestingly, we found that the mean uh, choroidal thickness in patients at RP with presence of anti-retinal antibodies was higher or greater than other patients without autoimmune retinopathy. So you see 279 microns compared to 237 uh, microns. You would expect in advanced uh, retinal dystrophies for the choroid to be relatively thinned. This was the anti-retinal antibody uh, profile in our patients. The most common uh, were 30, 35, 46, 62, and 90. Note the absence of 23 KDA, as I mentioned, no anti-recovering antibodies. And the majority of patients had more than one uh, positive antibody, so that's also important. Among the treatment uh, regimens, we did not, this is not a treatment trial. You see 19 patients received oral immunosuppression, uh, four patients had local treatment alone, and six patients had both local and systemic. But overall, there was only a slight improvement in visual acuity, as we would expect, because all these patients had underlying disease. But 70% of patients had expansion of at least 25% of their baseline visual fields. And out of six patients with cystoid macular edema, four had resolution. So I think there are some other benefits, not just in terms of visual acuity, but also visual function. This is one patient, 45-year-old, known RP. You can see the typical pigmentary change. Recent rapid worsening of vision was reported with metamorphopsia. She had significant macular edema, deep vitreous cells. And when we did the antibodies, it was positive for 23, quite a few, 23, right across to 90 KDA. Presenting vision was 6 over 21. After two orbital floor triamcinolone, 40 milligrams with oral prednisolone, followed by mycophenolate, antiretinal antibodies were still positive but significantly reduced in number, and visual acuity re returned to 67.5 with full resolution of macular edema and resolution of deep vitreous cells. So my current treatment algorithm is local therapy with an orbital floor triamcinolone or an intravitreal dexamethasone implant. Systemic therapy, the first line will be prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram for a week, uh, followed by uh, t rapid tapering. The second line will be cell sept. Uh, if not, then azotyoprine and cyclosporin A are good alternatives. And my third line will be biologics. But really the key problems uh, with autoimmune retinopathy and its treatment is are these antibodies cause or effect? Well, it could, the, the presence of antibodies does not always mean disease causing. Well, of course, in certain diseases like perineoplastic, uh, autoimmune retinopathy, or primary uh, non-perineoplastic, uh, non it's likely that these antibodies are directly responsible for retinal degeneration. But what about patients who have pre-existing uh, retinal disorders, such as RP? Uh, it may not be a cause of their progressive visual loss. It could well be an epiphenomenon where because of the breakdown of the blood retina barrier, you have exposure of the immune system to these anti antigens, resulting in secondary formation of antibodies. And finally, we do see uh, antibodies in a normal population. But regardless of the initiating event, in the patients that we've seen with antibodies, 
uh, they have contributed to symptoms and the worsening of their pathologic process. Nonetheless, I think it's important to keep these in mind. These controversies still remain, and until they are settled, there's really no uh, uh, consensus uh, about the treatment of autoimmune retinopathy. Uh, th another major issue is really the lack of standardization or validation and stringent controls. In fact, there was poor concordance between laboratories. If you do anti-retinal antibody testing between one lab and the, and the other, you may not find the same results. Uh, in, in a study uh, by Ed Stone, uh, they found that they, it made a difference if you test for antibodies to aqueous soluble, which is the free form of antigen, rather than detergent soluble. So maybe the answer is to be more specific in what you are testing. And overall, if you, if you serially dilute uh, patient and control sera, you may be able to better differentiate between normals uh, and uh, pathologic uh, disease. So to conclude, circulating anti-retinal antibodies can be found in patients with pre-existing retinal disease, such as retinal dystrophies, in which they report rapid deterioration of visual function, which we can't explain by other causes. It's unsure whether they are pathogenic. It could well be just an epiphenomenon secondary to the breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. But when we suspect and detect and perhaps treat non-perineoplastic uh, non uh, autoimmune retinopathy, it can significantly alter the cause of disease by halting progression and even reversing acute change, such as a decrease in visual fields. But really what we need is validation, controls, and a prospective uh, clinical trial to define future treatment paradigms. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Koh. That was wonderful. Um, it answered a lot of questions that were niggling around in my head. And we'll take the questions in the panel discussion. Now, I invite Dr. Dhananjay Shukla to give his talk on photic retinopathies. Good afternoon. Uh, so we have heard that God said, let there be light, and there was light. But there can be something like too much of a good thing. So today I'm going to address why we don't need that much light. You know, the primary function of eyes is basically to see, and how do we see? We see when the light is reflected from the material world. But more is certainly not the merrier. If the light is a little dim, what we get actually, a little eye strain from muscle fatigue, but if you have too much of light, you can get actually retinal damage. So what is too bright? It is defined by either intensity or duration. So I'm basically talking about the, the three types of uh, injury from light to the retina. And we actually confuse between them, as I was gathering from yesterday when I presented that case, you know, we use these terms interchangeably. So yesterday, uh, Dr. Polido actually asked me about the plasma effect of light, actually, and that's actually refers to a photomechanical injury, where there's a massive bright flash, which results in instant tissue vaporization, and as it reported in industrial accidents, but we can use it therapeutically in yak capsulotomy. There can be something which is more subacute that happens in seconds and raises the temperature of retina a little less, about 10 to 20 degrees centigrade, as, uh, as we classically do therapeutically in laser photocoagulation of the retina, and which can also happen in laser point of burn, which Dilraj pointed about yesterday, and this is called a photothermal injury. But the most insidious one is the cumulative damage by what we call safe light. And this has been named uh, by a uh, lot of uh, names like photochemical, photic uh, injury, or phototoxicity. So when we talk of phototoxicity, we're actually talking about the insidious damage, which generally goes undetected, unreported, and massively underdiagnosed. The most classic presentations are eclipse and welding arc retinopathy. Yesterday I talked about the lightning, uh, which how it can uh, affect eye. And we have a therapeutic effect again here of phototoxicity, which is photodynamic therapy. So here the temperature rise is too low to cause thermal burns. So actually the term sunburn is a misnomer. The energy in the light photons excites actually the atoms in the target tissue, which result in free radical release and damage the pro protons and nucleic acid in the cell membranes and cell death. So the lower wavelengths of light, which have greater energy, and uh, yesterday again we discussed that, that uh, blue light pointers, though they are thankfully used less, they are more toxic to the retina. So the blue light is more toxic and the lower wavelengths uh, are more. And since the very low wavelengths like ultraviolet A and B and violet are mostly absorbed by the corneal lens, the photochemical injury basically mostly happens in the blue zone. It is called, therefore, blue light hazard. 
and especially vulnerable as a child or a young adult with a clear lens because these clear lenses can usher in some amount of even UVA light. So uh, aging does protect us actually in this sense, so we can be thankful, the aged among us. Uh, the nucleus sclerosis uh, protectors still we undergo a cataract surgery which removes the protection. Though they are UV blocking uh, intraocular lenses, but there's insufficient data to show that uh, they have any tangible protection. But uh, aging also makes us more vulnerable to photoxidity in a, another manner by uh, making, increasing the concentration of lipofusion in the RPE. So then there are other factors. If you have fever for any reason, any systemic disease, it can uh, raise the temperature of retina and make it vulnerable to even low intensity burn. There can be accumulation of lipofusion uh, in the young age also in the best disease in star guards. There can be degeneration of photo, uh, uh, pigment in the retinitis pigmentosa as was discussed earlier. And there are several drugs in the various categories like antibiotics, antimalarials, antipsychotics, diuretics, NSAIDs and even herbal supplements which have tricyclic, heterocyclic or porphyrin rings. They basically bind to the melanin retinal pigment epithelium and make it vulnerable to even visible light. And finally you can have a deficiency of antioxidants in the diet like fruits and vegetables. So let's look at the sunlight. Uh, how many and how many ways the sun can hurt us. Now, I have actually, when I was in Urban, I have met sun gazers, the religious sun gazers who think that the looking at the sun actually strengthens the light. I call them fools actually. And I think somebody from Varanasi or those regions should publish about it because there are, I still know there are a lot of sun gazing sa uh, sages in uh, those areas. And I have seen a lot of them with a lot of um, macular pigment stippling and very subnormal vision. And then there is something called eclipse watching, which is again much more common and much more common unfortunately in kids we are, who are more vulnerable because of their clear lenses. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, smartly the government generally keeps it a school holiday on eclipse, uh, major solar eclipses. But what we do not know is even the reflected sunlight from snow and other surfaces can bring back about 90% of the sunlight back into our eyes. And at least in India, sunglasses are very rare and therefore it's a very uh, relevant toxicity. So uh, I'll uh, begin by describing a physician actually who came to uh, me recently with distortion of vision in the left eye for several months and vision was slightly subnormal, 6 9 part. Anti-segment was normal but if you looked at the fundus, it clearly showed a faint yellow spot in the left eye and there was nothing in the right. Fundus autofluorescence was normal but when I did the optical coherence tomography in the left eye there was a clear cut defect in the outer retinal band specifically at the ellipsoid zone. And now when I proactively asked him the history of watching Eclipse, he remembered that. So that's the importance of proactive history taking. Case 2 was a healthy 50-year-old um, uh, man who, which, who had a mild diminution of vision and distortion in both eyes. He had good vision in the right eye and s slightly subnormal 6 12 part in the left eye. Uh, he was systemically healthy and uh, the color vision, contrast sensitivity and central visual fields were also normal in both eyes. Whereas Amstel's grid showed distortion in both eyes. The fund eye showed nothing actually except that the left eye, the uh, uh, central fovea had a darker pigmentation in the left eye, in the right eye, sorry. When I did the optical coherence tomography at the center of the fovea, the horizontal uh, refi showed nothing actually. When it was slightly above, it showed a definite defect in the band which is outside the ISOS junction. It initially was called the cost line, coast, uh, cone outer, uh, um, outer segment tips. Now it is called the interdigitation zone. So when I did the vertical scan, it clearly showed a defect there with also a thinning of the fovea. So, uh, sorry, there was no thinning of the fovea in the right eye. In the left eye, there was this defect right in the flush in the under the center of the fovea and there was also a thinning of the fovea to 148 microns. So this man had a definitely abnormal autofluorescence and remarkably these dark signals were scattered mostly above the horizontal drapey. So what it showed me that he was probably getting a lot of reflected light from the ground rather than from the sun. So uh, when I asked him again a leading question, uh, uh, since he was from the Himalayan region, he was uh, a professional trekker. He used to take trekking missions in snow-covered mountains and very commonly without protective glasses. So even a mild damage can damage the eyes and uh, shown uh, in a case of a, a young child whose uh, parents given gaming rights, uh, you know, as, as much as he wanted, so he reported a, a vision of 6 12 part in both eyes after a, uh, about a few days of non-stop gaming. The fundi were normal, but the OCT showed a very uh, disruption of not only the outer retina, but in the right eye, even the inner retina. The vision fortunately recovered to normal, but OCT defects uh, 
persisted. So Welder's retinopathy is very similar uh, when acute can give, uh, cause a very classic painful corneal abrasions, but in chronic, which is probably more common and underreported, the picture is very similar and identical to solar retinopathy. So what we have clinically is just a faint yellow spot. In a chronic case, we don't even have that. The symptoms are vague. Uh, and again, a subacute case, the patient may not remember what ha actually happened. We have to proactively elicit the history of exposure to bright light. And when the exposure is not corresponding to the severity of lesion, we have to look at the other features like systemic status, that is febrile illness, and the use of drugs or retinal disease. So among the investigations, OCT is enough to establish the diagnosis. Acutely, you see hyperreflectivity in the center. And in the late cases, we see the interruption of the outer retinal bands with an intact external limiting membrane. In very severe cases only, we see some foveal atrophy. The differential diagnosis is very important, but easy actually generally from MACTEL type 2, tamoxifen maculopathy, early vitreo macular traction, or a closing macular hole. A common recent differential is pauper's maculopathy. Uh, it's a party drug, which uh, again is, uh, the effect is compounded by looking at the laser lights in the discotheques. So autofluorescence uh, in acute phase may show a dark central signal, uh, which is uh, surrounded by uh, attenuated uh, hyperautofluorescence in the uh, parabacular region. And chronical, in the chronic case, it can be normal. However, it shows definitely more information than fluorescence in geography, which should not be done in these cases. So to summarize, whereas we are spending less time outdoors, especially our children, we are also at the paradoxically coming to the stage, uh, age of light pollution. So, and unfortunately, we are more conscious of the suntan or the skin burn than the burn on the macula. Even though the current electronic media like TV, computers, smartphones, and LED lights are declared safe so far, but we don't have any long-term studies on these, as I've shown in uh, one case report. And outdoor workers, especially welders, they need education about this occupational hazard because they are uh, frequently uh, exposed, uh, in, especially in India, uh, to a largely unprotected environment and without the protective glasses. And even the accept acceptable light exposure limits need to be defined in these cases uh, in the professional workers. So let's hope that we do not get burned by the very light that eliminates and nurtures our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shukla, for a very scary talk. And uh, now I invite Dr. Sada to tell us about newer imaging insights in retinal dystrophies. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that I thought too, it was too big a challenge to talk about all retinal dystrophies, so I'm going to limit my comments to, to Stargardt's uh, disease, which is a disease, interestingly, it's found in every region, and actually I've seen it in every country that I've visited. So, uh, in any event, uh, Stargardt's disease was originally described uh, over a century ago by Carl Stargardt in, in, in Berlin. And as I said, uh, it's interesting that it is uh, found uh, worldwide. Uh, there's at least uh, three gene mutations, although the vast majority, over 90%, are due to ABCA4 autosomal recessive Stargardt's co encodes a flipase important in the uh, photoreceptors. Not surprisingly, it, it, you know, the same, muta the same uh, mutations in this uh, gene can cause a variety of different diseases. Uh, it's because it's a big gene, and depending on the severity of the mutation, you might have different phenotypes. Not particularly surprising. Uh, it is a slowly progressive uh, condition, uh, certainly uh, onset uh, early in, uh, in life. Uh, and very early on, uh, things can actually appear quite normal before you develop the hallmark Piscoform uh, flex um, uh, and eventually the macular atrophic uh, lesions, which are classically described to have this beaten bronze type appearance. We had a very nice talk earlier on electrophysiology, um, uh, and as noted, I mean, the ERG findings can be variable. Oftentimes, early in the disease, the, the full field ERG is uh, quite, uh, quite normal, although because of the macular findings, the multifocal, uh, as was nicely pointed out, uh, can show a central uh, depression. I don't do fluorescein angiography anymore to make this diagnosis, but certainly uh, people have described the dark choroid effect due to the lipofuscin accumulation. Part of the reason I don't do it is because I don't li like to expose, the, expose these patients to a lot of blue light. Uh, fundus autofluorescence imaging, another thing that can expose these patients to a lot of uh, blue light, um, uh, can be useful in, in making the diagnosis, at least initially, with this characteristic fleck uh, pattern, as well as the macular atrophy. And of course, we use this as a tool to follow and track the atrophy over time. Uh, the flecks can be quite extensive with these individuals uh, and can also be nicely uh, revealed by the autofluorescence imaging.
changing. Uh, there is a, a classification that Noble and Carr described in terms of the types of uh, phenotypes you can see in this condition. I don't actually quite, a, quite frankly find this to be of any value, so I don't use it in my classification of patients. That's sort of a quick synopsis of what we know about the disease. Um, and there's actually probably a lot more that we don't know, but we have learned a little bit at least. And, and, um, and uh, so, uh, so there are a number of questions that have come up over the years uh, in terms of, you know, what are all the different manifestations that we can see in the disease? Because I actually find this disease to be uh, fascinating, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what we've learned about different manifestations, and also what we've learned about OCT in this disease. Uh, other questions are, you know, we know that uh, there are a number of different mutations that can occur in this large ABCA4 gene. How does that relate to the actual manifesting phenotype or the progression of the disease? And in fact, how fast does the atrophy progress in Stargardt's? Because many of you know there's huge interest right now in the biopharma community in terms of uh, targeted therapeutics uh, for Stargardt's disease. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that those of us who are involved in reading centers, we've been contacted to try to come up with methods to quantify the atrophy reliably. You can see in a case like this, that might be quite a challenge. So I'll give you some insight into that as well. So in any event, how do we address some of these uh, questions? Uh, that was one of the inspirations. Hendrik Scholl deserves a huge amount of credit. Hendrik's obviously in Basel now. He was at Hopkins when he started this Progstar program that was funded and supported by the Foundation Fighting Blindness. So we became involved uh, by looking at the images um, at the reading center level, but this is sort of the largest collection of subjects with Stargardt's ever um, uh, evaluated, uh, and this was a multi-center collaboration, uh, centers across North America and Europe, in fact, and we were the central reading center. I don't have time to go through all of the inclusion criteria, but these were all confirmed uh, Stargardt's uh, cases. Uh, we first started with a retrospective study where we sort of said, well, whatever data we have on these people over years, let's just bring it in so we can learn something from them. Uh, and, and I have to tell you from a reading center, from, from a personal level, we had kind of hoped to say, well, why don't we use, we developed all these tools and methods to attack geographic atrophy in AMD. Uh, can we not use the same methodology in Stargardt's? And a case like this, you might look at it and say, yeah, sure, it should work pretty well. We can trace and outline these things, quantify them, track them over time. But the challenge in Stargardt's, and this is something we call definite decreased autofluorescence when it has this black sort of appearance. But in Stargardt's, we find that there are many patients who present uh, with uh, findings like this where clearly it's not 100% black. You can see that it's not even. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, we wondered, is this the same as the previous case that I showed you? Is there something different? Should we quantify it the same way? You know, we, we gave this a name, questionable decreased autofluorescence uh, for these sort of grayish type of lesions. But then we had even more problems. Again, we had cases like this, and you look at that and say, well, is that atrophy? If I asked you and said, is that atrophy, uh, what would you say? And we, 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 we really weren't sure, actually, quite frankly. We thought it probably was, and I'll show you some information why we believe that that is. But, you know, we were really puzzled as to how to quantify it. We came up with this horrible name, poorly demarcated, questionable decrease out of threats. Don't you like these acronyms? I know David Seraf loves acronyms uh, like this. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, this unfortunately is a fairly frequent finding uh, and is something that we found that we had to, had to deal with. So, so again, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we learned in, in looking at even the progress, uh, uh, the, the retrospective data is that these eyes can have a fair amount of asymmetry. It's very interesting. We start to assemble these kind of progression sequences. Uh, we could sort of see how these atrophic uh, patches evolve from, you know, you went from bright flecks to dark flecks to eventually to, um, uh, to these atrophic lesions. Uh, but one of the scary things for the retrospective assessment, because I was really hoping that poorly demarcated questionable decreased autofluorescence would be an infrequent finding and unfortunately that's not the case. You can see that that was quite common and which means that we were in for a nightmare. Uh, we kind of knew that in, in taking on this uh, project. Uh, but we did learn something from the retrospective assessment. We were able to track again, as I said, um, these patients over time from all of this data that was accumulating in, the, in, in their clinics. We were able to find that the rate of progression was quite slow. You saw from Barry Cooperman's talk and some of the GA studies, the rate of progression, this was about a quarter to a third of what we see with GA associated with AMD. And if you have poorly demarcated autofluorescence, it was even, even slower. Uh, many of the patients who actually presented with this poorly demarcated uh, um, areas of atrophy, they did progress to uh, more um, uh, concrete, well demarcated areas of atrophy, and that was kind of interesting as well. There have been other smaller efforts looking at Stargardt progression rates in the literature, uh, and uh, there have been a whole host of different rates. Uh, you know, we, we were sort of in, our, in the lower end compared to some of the previous reports, but again, quite lower compared to AMD-related atrophy. So something very important to keep in mind about Stargardt's disease. But again, this 
is all from the retrospective study. That's always a little messy. Uh, and so we did have a prospective study to track these patients over two years. Uh, for the prospective study, uh, you know, there was a lot of concern from the Progster group investigators exposing these patients to intense blue light. And so we actually work with Heidelberg Engineering. Art Sedesian at, at UPenn has been a real pioneer in this uh, concept of using a lower um, intensity light source. You can get away with it in Stargardt's because those eyes are so chock full of lipofuscin. You just don't need that much light to excite them. Uh, in fact, we had published that we can do reliably grading of, of atrophy on this reduced or this RAFI protocol of reduced um, autofluorescence imaging intensity. In any event, uh, this was the cohort size over 250 patients in the prospective study followed for, for two years. We looked for these different types of autofluorescence phenotypes that I just described. Uh, and uh, we also looked for some other features which some of the investigators thought might be predictive of, of growth of these lesions, and whether they have a heterogeneous background in terms of the autofluorescence pattern of the flex extend beyond the arcades. That was another feature that we looked for. Uh, and again, so what did we find? Again, we tracked these cases over time, uh, and we observed that, uh, in fact, we, uh, that uh, there were many uh, patients who, did, who didn't have uh, well demarcated um, um, abnormalities that developed well demarcated abnormalities over time. The growth rate seemed to be fairly similar to what we found in the retrospective study, so that gave us uh, some measure of confidence. We found that patients who had heterogeneous background, though they did grow substantially faster, uh, as did patients who had multifocal lesions. And patients who did have more flex, especially extending beyond the arcades, also seemed to manifest a faster growth rate. What about OCT? You know, we were interested in OCT because we had patients like this. You don't really see anything. But this patient actually has underlying progressive retinal thinning. And that's a real challenge in Stargardt's. And so we thought that segmenting the various retinal layers would be a value. We produced these kinds of maps of different uh, layers of the outer retina. Uh, and we actually observed that, in fact, when you compared questionable to definite decreased autofluorescence, the main difference was really the relative status of the photoreceptors. There was some partial intactness in the questionable decreased patients compared to the patients with uh, definite decreased autofluorescence. And to keep going, we also had microperimetry data. And it was interesting, again, you know, when I say like all of these areas we really should consider it to be atrophy is that even in these areas of poor, well, not, not or questionable decreased autofluorescence, even these poorly demarcated areas, there were still absolute scotomas in these patients. These really are areas of atrophy in these individuals. I did not realize that. So this was really new information uh, for me. And we even have the progression rate in terms of the decibel loss of microperimetry. So these are all potential targets we can use in future uh, therapeutic trials. So to summarize, uh, I've shown you that Stargardt's has actually a very diverse phenotype. It's actually an amazing disease. The macular atrophy can be quite different. It is very slow in its progression, which is a challenge for uh, future clinical trials. But I did identify a few factors that may be associated with more rapid growth rate, and that could potentially be of some value for us in these future studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sada. Now I invite Dr. Ilad Mosieh for his talk on protective effect of intravitreal administration of exosomes derived from mesenchymal stem cells on retinal ischemia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the VRSI for the invitation here. It's a great meeting and I'm very happy to attend. <clears throat> so, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, they've been known for years, and we know they have a healing effect. Uh, in, recent, in, in previous years, it was thought that maybe they uh, change or integrate into the tissues that we uh, use them to treat, but we now know that their effect is, is due to a paracrine effect, that they are secreting uh, agents and growth factors that, that affect the suffering cells that have not yet uh, become atrophied. Uh, exosome, this is the, the buzzword of my talk, they are intra intracellular vesicles. They are very, very small, only 50 to 100 nanometers, uh, which are loaded with proteins and microRNAs produced by the uh, mesenchymal stem cells, and they are a major part of their paracrine effect. Uh, the exosomes are not unique only to mesenchymal stem cells. They're actually part of al almost every cell, but this is a major uh, pathway through which they can exert their actions on other cells. They are formed by endocytosis, which means on their outside, they don't have any surface markers, so they can be used allogeneically without immunosuppression. <coughs> this is an electron microscopy photograph showing how they're budding out of a mesenchymal stem cell. And uh, what I like to think of them as are like health packs, okay? It's like the mesenchymal stem cells that we can use to treat uh, diseases. 
uh, secrete them out and they can be picked up by the target cells and uh, enjoy their effect. So wh why are they so appealing uh, for research? They're simple to obtain and administer. They can be easily stored even long term and remain stable. They have a great sa safety profile in previous animal models, uh, not in ophthalmology, but this is how uh, we came across this idea. And as I said before, you can use them allogeneically without immunosuppression, which is a huge plus. And uh, when we set up to do this study, there was no previous study of exosomes in ophthalmology. This is just in short the rationale. Uh, our collaborators at the UC Davis uh, Institute for uh, Regenerative Cures have found a way to har harvest a lot of the uh, exosomes when they're growing mesenchymal stem cells under hypoxic conditions. And they've also shown that these exosomes are loaded with pro-angiogenesis uh, factors. This is uh, just a, an example slide from a study of a model of hind limb ischemia. It's an older study, but you can see uh, by uh, the color Doppler ultrasound that after treating with exosomes, the, the reperfusion was much better in the animal that was treated with exosomes. And we thought maybe we could do this in the eye. And because we were using hypoxic uh, conditions to grow the mesenchymal stem cells, we chose a hypoxic uh, model, uh, which is the OIR model, which I will elaborate on for retinal ischemia. So we used the, the regular black six mice. Uh, we got them at the one week of age. <clears throat> and they are put, this is just to show how small they are, they are put for, one, for five days at 75% oxygen, which is much higher than normal room air. And then after those five days when you take them out, normal room air is relatively hypoxic to them. And within two weeks, they all develop new vascularization. This is a picture of our setup and a dextran mound showing the neovascularization and the ischemia caused by this model in all mice. Then, after the five days that they spent in the hyperoxic conditions, we divided 12 mice into three groups and injected one eye of each mouse. In one group, we injected exosomes. In the second group, we injected just with saline for control. And the third group, actually, we did not put under hypoxic condition, and they served as a second control. And these are just pictures showing how hard it was to inject these little tiny eyes. After two weeks of being in room air, which for them is relatively hypoxic, uh, we uh, did combined uh, fluorescein uh, angiography and phase variance OCT, which is kind of an equivalent for OCTA, uh, and then sacrificed the mice and took them to histology. So this is the fluorescein angiography of mice from the normal, uh, from the normal group grown the whole time under room air, there's no ischemia and no new vascularization. This is a fluorescein uh, scan from uh, one of the mice that was treated with saline, and you can see the marked ischemia and new vascularization. And this is from a mouse that was treated with exosome. You can see it's, n it's not normal, but there's less ischemia and less new vascularization. From the phase variance OCT, uh, of course, we don't see any leakage, but you can see the capillary networks which on the left, you see the normal mouse in the center, marked non-perfusion, and in the treated, the exosome treated group, you see there was significant preservation of the retinal capillary network. Uh, on the bottom part, you can see B scans, and you can see that mice that spent time in the OIR model had uh, thinned retina, but you can also see uh, abnormal flows in the inner part, which corresponds to new vascularizations, and this was absent in the normal group. After sacrificing them, we took them to histology. And an advantage of this, model is, of this model is that you can quantitate the neovascularization by counting the number of nuclei which are on the vitreal side of the ILM. No cell should be inner to the ILM. So on the left, you see a normal control. And on the right, you can see cells that are on the ILM. These are neovascular, neovascular nuclei. And also some red blood cells that you can see in the vitreous that correspond to, to a vitreous hemorrhage. Then we counted uh, eight scans per eye at the same uh, locations, and we also analyzed the fellow eyes of the mice that were treated with uh, exosome, which are basically eyes that were not treated at all. And we saw that eyes that were not treated at all, or eyes that just got the sham injection of saline, had a lot of neovascularization, and it was markedly reduced in the eyes that were treated with exosomes. So our conclusions were that uh, this is a feasible uh, new therapeutic approach. Okay, it's well tolerated. Again, a, a huge advantage is that there's no immunosuppression. These mice were not immunosuppressed. And it, there seemed to be a protective effect on retinal ischemia. 
future directions um, are to take this to other types of uh, diseases, uh, especially uh, degenerative diseases. What if this could be a treatment for, for AMD? And right now we're trying to find ways to control the contents of the exosomes and maybe make, make them more fitted to, uh, to AMD. Uh, and we have an on, ongoing study on, uh, um, on, di on a diabetic model in animals and have not yet uh, gone, of course, into human trials. I'd like to thank my collaborators and you for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. That looks very interesting. Um, now, I'd like to invite Dr. Rajini Bhattu for giving her talk on current therapies for retinal degenerations. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, my thanks, Dr. Vaishali and Dr. Pavan Chori for inviting me here. Um, so December 2017 was a historic time for you know, the world of retinal dystrophies because uh, Luxturna, the first US FDA approved gene therapy product was you know, uh, in, in force. And so if you look at retinate, there are close to 300 genes that cause retinitis pigmentosa alone. So in any class, uh, in, in any uh, um, clinic that sees retinal dystrophies, the commonest that we see would be you know, rod cone dysfunction or retinitis pigmentosa, followed by star guard and you know, uh, um, others. What's the current treatment for retinal dystrophies? Only in a very few selected ones where we've completely understood the biological pathway, like refsums or gyrate, there is some treatment that we can say that we can halt progression of the disease. But otherwise, the uh, role of vitamin A and DHA and so on is still questionable. So the treatment options overall can be divided into two groups. Those that are mutation or gene specific, so that's the gene therapy group. The other one is a mutation independent approach, which would be either the cell replacement therapy or the retinal processes. So let's look at retinal processes. Uh, both we, we now have both the uh, subretinal and the epiretinal implants, and this is currently being used mostly for patients with end-stage disease. And I won't go into the details. That's the Argus II, the 64 electrode implant. And uh, it's uh, currently not available. I, I, I'm not sure if anybody has used it, although it's an USFT approved one. So although the trials for gene therapy started way back in 2008, the first uh, USFT approved drug came in December 2017. And currently, there are several trials for both phase one and phase two uh, trials for several of these, like horodremia and star guards, like was you know, mentioned earlier, retinoschisis, cone dysfunction, and so on. So the uh, phase three study for you know, uh, um, RP65 associated retinal dystrophy showed that it was, you know, the uh, therapy was both effective and safe. And so the US FDA did approve it. Now, there are several challenges to it. Whether a one-time administration would be sufficient, is it a long-term benefit? Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that the cargo capacity, the ability of the viral vector to uh, carry the gene is limited. Like, you know, uh, star guts, for example, is a very large gene. So whether gene therapy is going to be able to, you know, uh, um, uh, be useful in, these, in all of these is a question. Now, each of these diseases, of course, have a very small subset of patients. That's another challenge. I think the biggest challenge is that it is very expensive. So Luxterna, as of today, is about uh, one injection is about $450,000. Um, is that right, Dr. Sada? I think it's about $50,000 per injection per eye. That's just the cost of the injection. So that's where you know, uh, a cell-based therapy or stem cell therapy is uh, a little more useful. So basically, cell-based therapy is the use of ocular-derived ocular, uh, retinal progenitor cells, which could either be from embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, embryonic stem cells are obtained from the blastocyst. So there are some concerns, although a majority of the studies that are being done are from embryonic stem cells as of now. IPSC is Professor Yamanaka from Japan. He showed us for the first time that you, know, you could use um, uh, stem cells from either the skin or the blood, and, uh, uh, and therefore you don't have to specifically use embryonic stem cells. And so I'd like to you know, spend the next couple of minutes talking about our work. 
Induced pluripotent stem cells derived retinal cells in disease modeling and regenerative medicine. I'm, uh, I'm part of a company called iSTEM that where we're looking at specifically retinal stem cells for most retinal degenerative diseases. So we're looking at uh, both the RP and the photoreceptor replacement eventually. So the, uh, we started with iPSC. We really did not go into the embryonic stem cell path. IPSC, we started with um, uh, peripheral blood and then go through the usual in vivo milestones that you know, uh, uh, happens for uh, the growth of these. And what we've done is two things. One is we have differentiated these stem cells into retinal pigment epithelium. And so these are the markers. So typically, these are all you know, obviously uh, 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 basic science work, all in vitro work where we've been able to grow the, I'm sorry, I think the, neither works. Is another pointer? You can use the, no, that's, yeah. that doesn't, oh yeah, I can see this, yeah, thank you, yeah. So we, we pick up these, uh, we pick up these, you know, uh, rosettes and then continue to differentiate them into retinal pigment epithelium. So typically by about 35 to 40 days, it's a very pigmented one. Is that working? Yeah, thank you. So we further went on to authenticate this pigment epithelium. So these are several markers for the RPA itself, uh, the uh, CRX, MITF, OTX2. So there are, there is, these are specific markers for retinal pigment epithelium. And so our next work was uh, um, in with uh, uh, studies, uh, animal studies. So this is what we used, nearly mature RP between 60 and 70 days. And uh, um, we have shown functional efficacy of these RPE cells, both in terms of the PDF and the VEGF uh, expression of these uh, cells, and further quantification by the QPCR. Um, we've had one patent pile, uh, file because what we've done is to show that there is a common pathway that can, till a, beyond a certain point, can be used both for photoreceptors and RP, and therefore we have a, a patent file for that. Um, our animal studies were done in the RCS rat, now this was uh, done in Oregon, uh, Portland. Um, we did try our initial studies in uh, India. We didn't succeed much. So the RCS rat is a good model to simulate animal disease. Basically carries a mutation in a gene called the MERTK gene, which acts as a very good model for both AMD and retinitis pigmentosa. So we transplanted uh, uh, two dose of cells, 50,000 and 100,000 cells in the subretinal space. Uh, in these rats, and we had a set of uh, BSS um, as, as controls. And optokinetic uh, tracking was the functional assessment used for these animals. And half the animals were sacrificed at 60 days, and the other half at 90. And so we had a successful blep formation. I'll just show you a couple of results. Um, so this is just one of the uh, animals at day 60. So the uh, uh, surrogate that is used is the outer nuclear layer. So this is a, uh, uh, an animal where the, uh, which is a control where you do not see the uh, uh, ONL clearly. And this is an animal that's injected with, the, uh, with our stem cells. This is another immunohistochemistry which shows the presence of the uh, cells there. And we also, uh, what it showed us was that the thickness of the outnuclear layer was significantly different in the, between the temporal and the nasal areas. Temporal is where it was injected and these were the cones per image, and those are the optokinetic nystagmus um, uh, thresholds at 60 and 90 between the controls and the um, uh, animals. So that difference seems significant. The, there are a couple of you know, phase um, uh, one and early two phase trials that are going on. This was from Japan, which showed where they have injected a sheet uh, with an RP um, as a skiffold. And this is the other one, which is probably the most advanced with Operation Cell Cure, this company, where they also have shown a significant uh, improvement. And this is their publication, which has shown the, this is before injection, and that's after injection that you can see the RP there. Uh, there are several challenges of whether we should go you know, with a sheet versus the suspension. I won't get into those now. 
Uh, what we have done further, our, our pipeline further, is to look at photoreceptors. We have differentiated photoreceptors, you know, uh, significantly already. We have we've, we've started our, we're just about to start our experiments with a, a lab in Delhi. Uh, they have a, a RD1 model, which is again a very good model for uh, photoreceptor um, uh, problems. Um, there are going to be several challenges as we go along. I think one of the biggest challenges that I think we're going to face is the clinical challenges because basic science is progressing way too fast. Whereas clinical challenges of how are we going to inject these? Can we inject as a sheet? If that is the way, is there a method to do it? You know, uh, uh, with as much trauma as possible, uh, less trauma as possible to the retina. Uh, how do we deal with the immune rejections? And what is the real degree of visual improvement that we are going to notice? I think these are questions that we have to face as we go along. Um, that's our, that's my team there, and our, I thank our collaborators. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I call Dr. David Saraf to talk to us about early identification of plaquenil toxicity using a, a, a paper that uh, we uh, uh, we have just submitted to uh, to BJO, and it's uh, I believe will be in press uh, in the near future. So we'll talk about the new dosing guidelines, risk factors, early detection. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the the best imaging modalities to uh, detect plaquenil disease and some atypical presentations that actually will uh, fall in, uh, in line nicely with the theme of, of the session today. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, toxicity runs at about uh, 7% uh, uh, with plaquenil uh, treatment. Uh, ma plaquenil maculopathy is not uh, an uncommon uh, uh, disease. Uh, it, and it's best detected, I think uh, uh, we all agree, uh, with a functional and an anatomical test, visual field testing and SDOCT. It, the uh, incidence of toxicity is dose related and with the uh, uh, traditional guidelines of 6.5 mg per kg ideal body weight, it runs at about 10% two years, 40% at 20 years. Uh, more recently, uh, the Marmor Group has shown that this risk is significantly less uh, with a lower uh, um, uh, weight-based dosage, 2% uh, at 10 years and 20% at 20 years. And it is for uh, this reason that the guidelines have been uh, uh, changed uh, and optimized, if you will, uh, from 6.5 mg kg ideal body weight, uh, which is probably overdosing in the thin patients, to 5 mg per kg regular body weight. And in, in addition to having a lower uh, toxicity profile, uh, this is a much more practical uh, way to assess for toxicity in patients using their regular body weight. And so the AAO has already implemented this uh, in their guidelines. Uh, uh, keeping in mind, however, that the 5 mg per kg regular body weight still may be overdosing in the patients who lie uh, on the, um, uh, on the uh, higher, weight, uh, 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 higher weight graph the higher weight distribution. So in my clinic, uh, I do both. I do the 6 mg per 6.5 mg per kg ideal body weight and the 5 mg per kg regular body weight, and I use uh, the lower dosage, which generally runs uh, uh, 300 milligrams or lower. 400 milligrams, I think, nowadays is overdosing patients. There are other risk factors beside the cumulative dose, uh, and th those include tamoxifen uh, therapy, kidney disease, and so these should all be considered uh, in your uh, tamoxifen patients, but by and large, the most important uh, risk factor is cumulative dosage and 10-year 10, 10 dosage at, uh, or 1,000 grams uh, should uh, um, increase your sensitivity uh, to uh, look uh, for any evidence of toxicity. We talked already about the importance of a functional and, and a structural test. I think um, uh, uh, we all are familiar with the flying saucer sign uh, where you develop the perifoveal ellipsoid loss. Uh, this is an, um, uh, not an, uh, an uncommon presentation and probably represents a more advanced um, a manifestation of plaquenil disease. Uh, and I think all of us know how to detect that uh, using standard OCT uh, imaging. Uh, Marmor has put uh, this classification together where uh, uh, using visual field and uh, SDOCT, 
Uh, in the mild form, there is really only visual field uh, loss with the classic annular scotoma. And with more moderate and severe changes, you can see more obvious OCT uh, and severe annular scotoma. Uh, typically, the OCT changes of perifoveal ellipsoid loss occur in the infratemporal uh, quadrant, and the OCT map can show, shows that very nicely. Marmer uh, has indicated that 10% of patients can have uh, uh, visual field, uh, typical visual field findings of an annular scotoma in the absence of OCT evidence of disease. So according to his studies, the, the visual field test may be the most sensitive marker. But we've recently collected uh, close to a dozen patients worldwide where we were able to detect OCT changes actually before uh, there was any evidence of visual field loss. So you can see here a normal visual field. And if you examine this uh, OCT very cl closely, you see very subtle thinning and rarefaction of the ellipsoid in the perifoveal region that was corroborated with microperimetry and multifocal ERG despite a normal visual field. So uh, we believe that the OCT uh, in some cases uh, may identify early disease and, and the importance of multimodal imaging uh, can help you verify uh, the, the development, uh, the identification of these findings, as in this case uh, in which the patient had high risk cumulative dosage up to 2,000 grams. This case is even more, I think, convincing. This is from uh, Bailey Freund. You can again see a normal visual field here. Again, very subtle changes of thinning of the ellipsoid, thinning of the outer a nuclear layer and a very, very early flying saucer sign. Uh, the patient was lost to follow up, came back seven years later, and then had the more obvious flying saucer sign. So be very, I think, uh, sensitive about uh, uh, OCT in patients who are high risk with 1,000 or 2,000 grams cumulative dosage and look very carefully at that perifoveal ellipsoid area. Uh, sometimes you may even want to use a vertical scan to try to elicit these very subtle uh, changes uh, at the ellipsoid level that we see in some of these patients um, that were uh, collected in our study. And I think the use of multimodal imaging, uh, in addition to the two gold standard modalities, visual field and SDOCT, can help you decide if the patient needs uh, to be off um, uh, Plaquenil. Fundus autofluorescence, I think, really is, is an important uh, modality, but really detects uh, lesions later in the disease. Uh, the characteristic uh, bullseye maculopathy showing the hyperautofluorescent ring. I think um, uh, you, there's also the importance of showing the Asian manifestation of the more eccentric or distal uh, um, finding of this uh, R, uh, ellipsoid and RPE loss. Uh, uh, more peripheral as opposed to the more classic parafoveal uh, change. And another example showing this more eccentric uh, um, ellipsoid and RPE loss uh, in this case of toxicity. I also will use autofluorescence to track the changes uh, uh, that have already developed. And you can see in this time-lapse video, there's very obvious progression of disease despite uh, discontinuation of therapy. And again, on this montage as well, you can see progression uh, uh, over the years in this patient who stopped therapy. Uh, other uh, a entities that perhaps in the future may be important include uh, quantitative and uh, um, uh, quantitative autofluorescence, as you can see in this slide. Uh, uh, tools that we've used in the past, such as fluorescein an angiography and full field ERG, really not useful uh, in, in detecting early disease. Here you can see a bullseye maculopathy with fluorescein angiography, but this is already a very advanced uh, change, as you can see on the visual field. This patient with a, um, uh, uh, a little bit of a bullseye maculopathy, uh, very advanced uh, on follow-up, you can see a more obvious uh, cookie-cutter lesion uh, with progression after discontinuation of therapy. Amani Fazi has indicated that the loss of the ELM can be a biomarker of, of change, and if the ELM is lost, you're going to see progression of disease, uh, whereas if the ELM is preserved, you can see reconstitution of the ellipsoid with discontinuation of therapy, as you can see in the bottom panel. Uh, in some cases of 
uh, uh, plaquenil disease, you can actually see panretinal degeneration, as is evidenced in this full field ERG with associated CME, and so with very uh, significant uh, cumulative dosages and advanced disease, you can have widespread retinal degeneration. In this particular case, there was again uh, a widespread, widespread ellipsoid loss uh, with CME, and it looked like a retinal dystrophy, uh, but this patient had very high cumulative dosages of plaquenil up to 2,000 grams, uh, and you can see a, an extinguished ERG, both with a loss, both with loss of the uh, scotopic and significant depression of the photopic flash and flicker response, complete loss of the cone ERG with multifocal ERG, uh, and it, it turns out that there was a genetic dystrophy that we felt was being uh, exacerbated with plaquenil disease. So um, be careful uh, uh, to be aware of, of panretinal disease and, and the possibility of exacerbation of a genetic uh, mutation uh, um, in conjunction uh, with significant plaquenil exposure. So in summary, dosing, new dosing guidelines, five mg per kg regular body weight. Uh, be aware of risk factors. Look very carefully at the OCD, OCT and use multimodal imaging to make your final decision regarding um, uh, plaquenil discontinuation in conjunction with the systemic internus. And be aware of atypical presentations that can be associated with panretinal uh, degeneration and sometimes exacerbated uh, with um, uh, the by, by an associate by a combined association of a genetic mutation. Thanks for your, uh, uh, thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you. And with that, now we come to the final talk by Dr. Pulido Jose. Uh, he'll talk to us about beyond checkpoint inhibitors and towards melanoma vaccine. So for the last, thank you, for the last 12 years, um, I've been working um, on this and We've gotten pretty good at eradicating local melanoma. The problems are preserving good vision and preventing metastases. The FDA has approved three forms of cutaneous, cutaneous melanoma treatments, vemurafenib and equivalents, which inhibit BRAF, checkpoint inhibitors, and MEK inhibitors. And what I want to describe to you today is something that uh, recently was given the name xenogenization. And I don't like that name. I prefer xenophilia or xenopoiesis. And that said, a high rate of mutations or overexpression of antigens allows for changes in the proteins that can cause and, and activate an immune response to an altered self. Um, interestingly, if you have bladder cancer, you can just infuse BCG in patients with low, uh, very mild bladder cancer and take care of it. And the reason is that you've induced an infl inflammatory response that causes an immune reaction to that localized bladder cancer. And you can induce nonspecific immunity now with these checkpoint inhibitors that are now called um, CEMA, uh, checkpoint inhibitor monoclonal antibodies. And the way that works is you need two, um, uh, two um, proteins to interact to get the T cell activated. One is the T cell receptor and another is um, the CD28. But if on the other hand you get an inhibition by um, CTLA and that gets activated, the T cell gets downregulated. So what the antibodies do is it binds the CTLA so the T cells are activated all the time. Yervoy was one of the first ones, um, and it blocks uh, down regulation of the T cells. So the T cells, every T cell in your body is activated. And it works somewhat. If you give it to patients with cutaneous melanoma, it does have some effect. But the problem is now every T cell is activated. And yes, the cutaneous melanomas have some um, foreign antigens to the, to the T cells. but there's even more foreign antigens in the gut. There is more bacteria in the gut than there are stars in the entire universe. So these patients get a lot of um, off-target effects, for instance, colitis because of the fact that of the bacteria in the gut, hypophysitis, hepatitis, and occasional VKH-like syndromes. Let me show you a case. This is a patient 
who was an American soldier, and this was taken um, uh, before he went off to war uh, by uh, the hospital elsewhere. And you can see a very localized pigmented lesion here. And he came, comes back and sees me, and he has um, that two years later after he comes back from the war. So you can see the melanoma there. It was well positioned and treated with um, plaque brachytherapy, as you can see here. And um, three months later, the tumor is decreasing in size, but the PET scan um, shows later um, lots of metastases, uh, which were biopsy proven. He was placed on Yervoy. Again, every T cell was activated, and he had a pretty good response going from that to, to that. So in this case, uveal melanoma responded um, to the Yervoy, uh, the nonspecific uh, upregulation of the T cells. But interestingly, look, he developed poliosis um, right there, and he also developed vitiligo. So he developed hypophysitis, colitis, um, vitiligo, poliosis. So we induced a VKH like syndrome to him, and he said that all of this was terrible and only war was worse. So how can we make it more localized? How can we just go tr get the T cells activated against the melanoma. So here's the situation. So this is a graph that shows the number of mutations per megabase for all of these um, cancers. And it, you can see over here melanoma. Well, you say, wow, that's good, but that's cutaneous melanoma because it's exposed to sunlight. Look at this graph. Down here is uveal melanoma. And if you put here response to the checkpoint inhibitors, the SEMA, and over here, the number of mutations per megabase, over here, you get cutaneous melanoma. You've got a lot of mutations per megabase and a really good response to SEMA. On the other hand, uveal melanoma has the lowest mutations per megabase and a terrible response to the checkpoint inhibitors. So what can we do to help that? So there's um, oncolytic viruses, and oncolytic viruses exploit differences between normal cells and cancer cells. And we use that all the time for PET scans, for instance. The Warburg effect is that um, uh, cancer cells use glucose and um, uh, glyco uh, non-aerobic um, me uh, metabolism of, of glucose more than normal cells. And that's why a PET scan works. Um, and likewise, cancer cells, um, be, they pr proliferate, and because they proliferate more, they're more susceptible to virus infections, and they don't respond to gamma interferon while normal cells do to protect them against viruses and cancers. So this was shown years ago. Here's a patient that had a Burkitt's lymphoma and got measles, and the Burkitt's lymphoma went away. Um, so Oncolytic viral therapy, when I got into this back around 2000, there was very little that was going on about it, but now it's become a big deal, as you can see in the number of PubMed papers. And oncolytic viral therapy, again, very little was done back then, but there's a lot going on now. The problems with translation is you can't get every cancer cell infected with the virus, so what you've got to do is called viroimmunotherapy. Get some of the cancer cells activated and get the immune response to come into those cells and see them as foreign and react to every other cancer cell the same way. So what we did was we made a library of prostate cancer and a library of the DNA in melanoma. Um, and we put them into a virus. And if you take the prostate cancer um, uh, cDNA library and put it into a virus and give it into a mouse that has melanoma, nothing happens, the mouse dies. If you take that prostate library and put it in a virus that, um, and then put it into a mouse that has prostate cancer, it treats the prostate cancer. Vice versa, if you take the melanoma cDNA, in other words, all the proteins that are expressed in a melanoma, put it in a virus and give it to a mouse that has melanoma, you treat the melanoma. 
And here's the cool thing. The mice that have it develop vote Koyanaga Harada's disease. So here's the cool thing, right? You can treat vote Koyanaga Harada's disease. I couldn't treat melanoma. So you've taken a disease that before was untreatable and turned it into something that's treatable. Is that cool or what? But the problem is um, the amount of proteins. We heard about the exosomes and the number of proteins in exosomes. So can you limit the number of, of proteins that you need to get this effect? And by the way, these were papers that were published in Nature Medicine and Nature Biotechnology, which have impact factors of, in the 30s. Um, and what we showed was, as you go through, you need at least three antigens to get an effect, to get a cure. So if you get a virus with three antigens, you, can, you, don't, need the, you, you don't need the entire library. And we're already were in trials for just the virus itself. And the virus is pretty well tolerated. It's a virus that also releases interferon. And remember I told you that um, interferon uh, works against cancer cells, but doesn't work against normal cells. Cancer cells um, don't respond to the interferon and allows the virus to enter cancer cells while the interferon protects the normal cells. What we've done so far, because the FDA only allows us to put in one antigen at a time, is made this construct, which has the interferon and one antigen, and these are melanoma cells that are treated with it. If you, oops, sorry, my time is up. Um, the bottom line is that uh, we're, the FDA has approved and given us an IND. I have had more problems with the IRB at Mayo than the FDA, but slowly we're getting to, and probably in the next two to three months, we'll be able to start treating patients with this. Thank you. Now I'd request Dr. Parveen Sen to go ahead with the panel discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sahana. So I'll try, first of all, I invite Dr. Ajay Dudani to join me as uh, one of the panel moderators and panelists. I'll try to do the difficult task of uh, rather different talks that we had today and see if we can go towards them one by one. Maybe uh, any questions from the audience we'll take first so that, uh, let's, yeah, please, Dr. Jose. something um, said by Dr. Shukla. So um, when it comes to plasma, you know plasma from making it with a neodymium YAG. Um, and there you take a laser and you um, get, put it in a uh, picosecond amount of time and give a high energy at a low time and you rip the electrons off the atoms to make the plasma. But lightning itself is plasma. And the reason is that there's something called the Debye constant. I have a master's in physical chemistry. <laughs> um, the Debye constant is the size of the distance between two um, two particles interacting. And lightning is such that the distance is great enough that it's greater than the Debye constant. So lightning is a different form of plasma, okay? So yes, you are technically right for a laser, but I am right in terms of what lightning really is. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Sada. I have a question for Adrian, um, actually. So, um, Adrian, I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to get your guidance on 
on what patients with uh, RP that you do this uh, type of testing to actually look for antiretinal antibodies. Uh, is it only in patients who maybe have photopsias, other symptoms that make you think that? And the reason I ask is, I'm very worried about getting uh, antiretinal antibody testing because there's obviously a high false positive rate, and then once you get it, then you're sort of stuck. Then you sort of have to immunosuppress these patients. Uh, and when you, know, you come back and they have all these different antigens positive, you're just not sure. And I'm just wondering, do you do it selectively or is, do you do it in everyone? Thanks, Fas. I think it, at the moment, because of the cost of uh, the testing, it costs about uh, 700 US dollars. It is impossible to do it on everybody, and I'm glad we don't do it on everybody. So at the moment, it's those that I suspect uh, might have a secondary autoimmune uh, process. For example, the patients who have rapid progression of disease, you know that RP tends to progress very, very slowly over decades. And yet you can document both symptomatically as well as on the visual fields, a sudden drop in vision. Most times they have uh, important symptoms. I mentioned a smoky or hazy vision cells in the deep vitreous, and uh, cystoid macledema would be another uh, sort of warning sign. Photopsias plus minus because sometimes RP itself gives you photopsias, but hypersensitivity to light seems to be also a prominent symptom. So for those patients where they have progressive visual function very rapidly, I think it's worthwhile looking for antiretinal antibodies. Now what happens when you find antibodies in the serum is a totally different matter. As I mentioned, it can be found in normals, it can be non-pathogenic, so I think it's in the index of suspicion. I think we've had this uh, discussion, Jose, as well. One or two isolated antiretinal antibodies, you might not ascribe any significance to it, but you've, if you've got five, ten uh, positive antibodies, I think you probably have to pay, pay attention to it. But the only true test of it is really what happens when you immunosuppress. So when you treat them and you reduce that, uh, the antiretinal antibody load, does it stabilize or improve their visual fields? Does it improve their symptoms? Does the cystoid macular edema go away? And that's why I, don't, I can't ascribe to you a definite treatment uh, algorithm. Having said that, I think it's worthwhile, at least internationally, doing a prospective trial on all our RP patients. And then with you know, good controls, number one, to determine what percentage of patients with RP do have antiretinal antibodies and to what extent. And secondly, what is the normal false positive? At the moment, we don't know uh, the true answer to that. So I'm afraid I don't have all the answers. Can I, can I also just make a comment? Because I think that's a, a very important point that Voss brings up. I think really it's John Hecken Lively who was at UCLA uh, before Voss came, came on board and, and now is retired from, at the University of Michigan, who really has kind of uh, really spearheaded this effort to uh, look at autoimmunity in RP patients. And I think it's really um, a difficult uh, uh, entity to, gr to wrap your arms around. There's really no good evidence, I think, to show that uh, there is an autoimmune component in RP that would benefit from immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and the anti, it's just you have a degenerative uh, situation, a chronic degenerative situation. There's a release of many different antigens um, associated with that degeneration. And then it's very difficult to really um, uh, identify which of those, anti, uh, the, those uh, antibodies are significant. Even in the best of circumstances with autoimmune retinopathy, like a, um, uh, a situation where you're absolutely certain this is an RP, you have rapid progression of disease, there's no bone spicules, um, the patient may have an underlying autoimmune or, or an un underlying paraneoplastic situation. Even in those best of circumstances, the, the antibody profile can be very difficult to elucidate. And I think the only one that I really... is, uh, is recovering. In a uh, with a systemic association and enolase in some in some situations the, the 46 recoverance 23 those are the only two that really I think give me any kind of information but I think it's really important Adrian that you bring that up and it allows us to have a discussion because there are some differing uh, thoughts about how to how to approach it it's a, a difficult situation to to really understand and elucidate. Yeah, CRMP5 is a, absolutely another antibody. I know you presented a case in Milan last year 
that can be associated, cl clearly associated with definite, a definite systemic profile. Uh, in, in, and um, that, that, that antibody can be absolutely helpful. But very, uh, very rare. I, I have a comment on the same. Go on, go on, Parvi. It's okay, go ahead. No, on, on, along the same lines. Um, so these, many of these patients, you know, with RP, it's the same autoimmune retinopathy that I'm, I'm talking about. So most of these patients have some time where they notice a sudden decrease in their vision. Yeah? This is a very, very common history. I mean, to me, it's probably that there is, prob you know, a certain amount of photoreceptors with which they are, you know, managing, and it's a dip. So, you know, a, a sudden blurred vision probably is very difficult to really take on as a history to say this could be autoimmune retinopathy. Um, so how many of these patients do you really treat without actually getting uh, testing done? Because, you know, like in the INH talks, for example, we would actually, you know, that that's so it's a negative control we would do. So would you do something like that? You know, start patients empirically? It's difficult, I think, to start empirically because, you know, you're committing a patient to quite a long program of immunosuppression. And if you don't have any kind of validation, uh, at least showing that you are treating something that requires six months or a year or more of immunosuppressive therapy, I think it's difficult to justify unless you've decided to treat the disease locally. So, for example, if you see inflammation, and many of them actually have deep vitreous cells, inflammation, and you want to just treat the inflammation at the end organ and just ignore the possible effect of uh, secondary anti-retinal antibodies, then that's fine. You can go ahead and give, uh, you know, a, a, an orbital floor steroid or an intravitreal uh, dexamethasone implant. But if you really th believe that it might be driven systemically, then I think you need the anti-retinal antibodies to validate it. You know, we just try to look at the a cohort of patients that we see, a lot of them uh, with RP and CME, thinking that if they have an autoimmune uh, basis as well. But I saw that they definitely don't do as badly as other RP patients. So I'm wondering, are we looking at AIR or are we looking at a specific underlying gene defect which is the one which is responsible for this phenotypic expression? So have you had any gene testing for your patients before you label them AIR? No, I th don't think it is related to any particular gene uh, defect. In fact, we see it in a whole spectrum, sporadic, uh, recessive, dominant RP, and so on. So I don't see it you know, particularly affecting a particular group of, of genetic defect. Paradoxically, I think if they develop anti-retinal antibodies and secondary autoimmune retinopathy, maybe they would have a better prognosis anyway because these are patients where you can stop some of that process. Having said all this, just one last point. I think it's important to exclude primary autoimmune retinopathy as a cause, because sometimes patients are misdiagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. But actually, they have no signs of RP. If you do that ERGs, uh, you find uh, maybe an you know, you know, electronegative waveform. And then, if you find these antibodies, you are dealing with a primary non plastic that you can treat and that you can reverse. Yes, Dr. Jose, please. One other thing, too. Uh, oh, you want to say something? Please. Please. No, Dr. Shukla. My small question. I have a small question for Dr. Saraf, actually. Uh, so if you had to uh, uh, zero down on one test, actually, uh, because I'm in a clinic-based uh, uh, ophthalmologist, so like doing just an OCT and looking for uh, the flying saucer sign enough or do I have to uh, have a, you know, uh, or this uh, multifocal ERG or microparametry or uh, also, you said multimodal imaging. So uh, do we have a single test which is the most specific to for early diagnosis of HCQ uh, retinomacalopathy? Yes. Yeah. You're asking if there's okay. one test I would use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's that? The single best test, I mean, Mike Marmer, I think on the basis of his uh, studies would say visual field, but you're talking to someone who lives and breathes OCT. And so uh, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would do OCT, but I have to tell you, uh, I review you know, dozens and dozens of OCTs every day because I review all the OCTs for Stein, for UCLA, for all the uh, doctors who are not retina specialists. When I see a Plaquenil, requests come, come down the, uh, the pipeline to me that this patient has uh, a Plaquenil uh, exposure, I kind of shudder 
because I have to go through all the, the, the central scans and sit there and study the ellipsoid and look for subtle uh, thinning and, and depression. And in a, in, a, in a busy clinic, it's not what I want to be doing, uh, spending you know, a minute uh, studying the, the, uh, the B scans. Uh, but I think the OCT is, is, is really the single most important uh, methodology. And you know with the visual field, it's a subjective test. And if right. you, can, you can use an objective test, I think that's a, a, a better option. But I don't know that I would lay my hat on the changes I showed. I think I would, as we were discussing, I think you can always use microperimetry, uh, another more objective test, and multifocal ERG to help you if you suspect something on the OCT. But I think the OCT is the best first line method. Great, methodology. Thank you. Especially when you have to stop a drug like HCQ, which is a very useful drug you would definitely want to have it for sure that it is there. That's so I right. think OCT definitely helps. I think Mike Marmer showed at a sub subspecialty day this year, he had a paper presentation, which he, I think he's now liking the OCT. If there's any change there, there's no change. If there's a, even a little bit of change, it's predictive of effects 20 years later. So I think even he is uh, now advocating more uh, OCT. The early changes are very uh, diagnostic for subsequent damage. Dr. Kuberman, since you are there, can I ask you a question regarding sure. your talk? Sorry, Dr. Sada, we'll come back to you. Uh, this is just regarding your talk when you did say that most of the neuroprotectors that you used, you saw some kind of an increase in the CNV formation. No, so one specifically, complement inhibition. So specifically the Apelis uh, compound APL2, which is a complement C3 inhibitor. Uh, in that study, in the Philly study, there was an increased incidence in the treated eyes of development of choroidal neovascularization, uh, and it was more, and it was dose related, so that in the, in the group that got the, uh, the every other month uh, dosing was about a 9% risk. Those that got the uh, monthly dosing was a 21% risk. What I didn't show because we were so uh, uh, diligent about our, keeping our, ourselves on time was a subsequent slide, which looked at that in more detail, and it showed that the, uh, in the patients that had fellow Y choroidal neurovascularization, the risk of developing it in the treated eye that did not have it was much greater as well, even more significant. So I was thinking a step further. So okay. have you done something? Is there a role of trying to combine the neuroprotector with the anti -vegif? So that is one of the thoughts downstream. Uh, interestingly, there is another company, Neurotech, which has sort of kept alive and dead and alive, and it's not sure what its status is now, but they have an ability to do a drug delivery strategy where they could give a ciliary neurotrophic factor, which is, for example, a very good neuroprotectant, in combination with a VEGF inhibitor. Um, uh, so that's a different sort of setting. But one of people have proposed the possibility of giving uh, the, the complement inhibition into, in combination with some sort of anti-VEGF. But in fact, the incidence is low enough, and since the patients are being followed on a regular basis, Treatment was initiated pretty rapidly, but it still makes us somewhat uncomfortable to know that the therapy we're giving for GA may induce choroidal neovascularization. Thank you, Dr. Kuperman. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Th thanks for being I have a, a, a question for, for David. So David, you highlighted some potential higher risk situations for hydroxychloroquine toxicity, mostly centered around uh, body weight and the like. Uh, what, what is your feeling towards patients, for example, older patients, maybe they have AMD, so they have a disease that may fundamentally affect RPE cells. Do you modulate your decisions, or perhaps they have pseudodrusin and they may have ellipsoid alterations, maybe it's harder to find changes. So there's, a, there's the possibility on one side that they may have a fundamental RP susceptibility, and the other side that maybe it's harder to detect the toxicity because of other concurrent findings. How do you handle yeah, uh, that think, situation. Yeah, that, that's uh, a very important question because uh, we definitely see patients, uh, older patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, for example, who have uh, changes of AMD. I have one patient in particular who had very rapidly progressive GA uh, associated with clear evidence of AMD, but with high risk cumulative dosage. A Plaquenil, and I wasn't sure, is this her underlying AMD disease or was this uh, exacerbated by her Plaquenil exposure? So in her particular case, I did have a discussion with her that I was concerned that the, the Plaquenil could be aggravating or exacerbating her AMD, and I wanted her to have a discussion with her internist to see if it was possible to get off the uh, Plaquenil. I think, I think while 
there are situations where uh, discontinuing Plaquenil can be an issue for patients. Uh, more often than not, when you have this discussion with them, they, they will go to their internist, they will stop the Plaquenil, and they will be fine. Um, and I think you will be doing a service. So I don't think you should have a knee-jerk reaction to stopping it. You're absolutely 100% right. You should do it deliberately uh, in conjunction with the internist. But there can be situations where you can get them off the drug without any systemic consequence. And I think in patients who, with AMD, that would be a situation where I may want to get them off the drug before I see problems, especially when they start approaching the 1,000 uh, milligram, the 1,000 gram cumulative threshold. Just to add uh, a little thought that I often have when I see these OCTs, we often say that uh, plant, the HCQ or hydroxychloroquine toxicity is because of the RPE damage. But we hardly ever see any backscatter or RPE atrophy on OCT and only a localized EZ changes. So, Yeah, I, I think initially you do just see um, that hyperautofluorescent ring, uh, which is probably a reflection of unmasking of the RPE hyperautofluorescence. Bailey uh, talked a little bit about that yesterday uh, in one of the uh, uh, Rishi imaging uh, sessions. But I think with more progressive uh, um, disease, because of the important interplay of the photoreceptors with the RPE, there may be some more significant RPE change that does develop long term that would explain that, that the, the hypoautofluorescence that you see, um, maybe not as obvious on the OCT, but there must be some disruption of the RPE to explain that, uh, that hypoautofluorescence that you see probably with more long-term severe disease. I wanted to ask, is there any role for any antioxidants or lutein supplements in these patients who have already developed toxicity? Because yeah. now you have to treat, some, you know, once something, something that developed the toxicity, is there anything we can offer them to, you know, preserve their vision or recover slightly? No, but that's an interesting uh, thought uh, to, to perhaps um, uh, uh, elicit the protective effect of mac macular uh, luteal uh, pigment uh, uh, with exogenous uh, treatment uh, uh, in, in an effort to perhaps uh, preserve uh, photoreceptors. Um, sounds like a good study maybe, uh, but I'm not aware of any data. Perhaps uh, some of the bright people in the audience may have uh, uh, some, some idea about that, but I'm not aware. I know that there was interest in MACTEL, I believe. I th think Paul Bernstein was looking at using luteal pigment as a potentially a protective uh, factor in reducing ellipsoid loss in MACTEL, but I don't know that that's gained much traction yet. That's Thank a nice you. thought. It's a question. Uh, it's, yeah. not a, it's not a question, it's a comment to answer Dr. Sada's question. Maybe in that, uh, those uh, cohort of patients with uh, already some pre-existent AMD changes, multifocal ERG might be a better option to have a baseline multifocal ERG and to follow up agreed. to rule out plaquenil toxicity. Yeah, yeah agree, thanks. Uh, just a comment for Dr. Dhananji's talk, I think I would like to add uh, toxicity due to microscope. When long hours of surgery, yeah. sometimes the microscope light itself can cause the, the retinal damage. And if you are really unlucky, you may end up burning the macula. So you need to be really careful on making sure that your fovea is not right under the... Trainees, trainees. I just Especially want to, for trainees. I just yeah. want to add a small word because in the morning there was a discussion and chandelier lights are worse than actually the uh, endoscopic lights because they are stationary. Yes. So they focus on the market. Uh, Dr. Vas, you did speak on uh, fundus autofluorescence, but I think HRF is something we cannot finish any topic without talking on without about hyperreflective foci. So what is hyperreflective foci do to you when you see OCTs in retinal dystrophies? What does it mean to you? Does it mean anything different from AMD? Or, um, well, it, yeah, yeah, so, so, so it, it definitely different from AMD, and well, there's many different um, the sources. So, for example, in RP patients, you can have hyperreflective foci that are related to the intraretinal migration of the RP cells, which then surround the, uh, the retinal uh, vessels. Uh, in Stargardt, uh, you, you know, you, the hyperreflective yeah. foci correspond to the flex, and the flex uh, 
can be just above the RP or they can actually migrate into the retina um, and we've seen them in the, in the Progstar cohort certainly in many eyes where you can actually have flecks that seem to extend interretinally uh, to the mid retina uh, uh, you know, which, which is actually I never knew that that could happen but that's actually something we, uh, we observe in those individuals. And then of course there's Dr. Seraf's favorite sort of class of disorders which are sort of crystalline type diseases and you can have, for example, in Bietes as well, you can have hyperflective dots which are uh, which are present in the retina, but also actually interestingly in the in the choroid. In the so, choroid. That uh, is but you can typically. see it, but you can see some in the retina as well. I think I think Dr. Seraf has actually shown that. So so I guess uh, you know hyperreflective dots in in retinal degenerations are interesting because they're not so straightforward as just AMD. They're a whole host of different um, abnormal, there's a whole host of different uh, um, pathologies underlying um, their uh, presence. Right. Thank you. Uh, next question for uh, Dr. Mosev. I think it was a very interesting concept of exosomes for oxygen induced retinopathy. I'm, we do see a lot of retinopathy of prematurity in India. So, do you think you have a treatment for us in the pipeline? Can we use these exosomes? for ROP? Uh, that would have to be a really long pipe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and th there's, there are many issues to go through. Um, the OIR model is a good model for ROP. I mean, that's what yes, it simulates Yes, it's the same the model best. which you have used, yeah. so which is why I thought. Um, of course, I mean, it comes to mind. Uh, there are more, more common diseases that have some ischemic components, which we were actually hoping to target first. Um, you know, time will tell. Uh, we, it it to will have to go through. To make the pipe shorter, <laughs> if you, you compare the use of exosomes with anti-VEGF, do you think we could get some more answers faster because we have already established use of anti-VEGF for ROP? So we have not compared them yet, but uh, one essential difference is that VEGF is one component an important component in, in a pathway or several pathways. If you just talk about exosomes, each exosome is loaded with thousands of different uh, factors. So you actually affect a much broader, um, you exert a much broader effect on the cells. So I think uh, if they are properly loaded with the right ingredients, they could be more effective than VEGF. But again, this is this just is my feeling. It remains to be proven. So uh, we have an analysis on their content, but uh, I'm not 100% sure on, on, the, uh, on comparing different batches. Uh, I think there is some, some, uh, something to rely on in great numbers because there are many exosomes and each of them have, has many components. So probably in general it should be around the same, but I can't tell you with certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Last Thank you. one comment from Dr. Jose. So are we looking for some vaccines for other tumors as well? A absolutely. And um, one already is FDA approved for cutaneous melanoma using um, the herpes virus backbone. So um, when I got into this, as I said, in the two, uh, early 2000s, there was very little. But now this area is exploding. Some people are using polio virus for glioblastoma, and that was a, a paper in New England Journal of Medicine in August of this year. So, uh, with a, an accompanying editorial, so it's just skyrocketing. So, how, how would they select their their patients with cutaneous melanoma, for example? Who receives those vaccines? Uh, so, for the for the FDA approval for the cutaneous melanoma. It's patients that have um, metastatic melanoma that has not been responsive to BRAF or MEK inhibitors and have targetable lesions um, to treat. What we've gotten through the FDA is um, for patients, um, but not through IRRB yet, um, for patients with um, hepatic metastases um, from uveal melanoma, that have targetable lesions um, or cutaneous melanoma that's not been responsive to other agents. Okay, 
Thank you for the comment. And I think with that, we come to the end of the session. I thank my speakers and my panelists for putting up a good show. So till we meet again, thanks a lot.